Okay, Chuck Wilson, New Hope Community Church, and we are going to be at the St. Martin School this week, and that's where we are from now on. If you know how to want to know how to get to our Sunday services, 10 o'clock Sunday mornings, just go on our website, www.newhopechurchpa.org, and uh, you can figure you know, all the details around there. Also, next week, I'm having cataract surgery. So Josh will be preaching. Josh Wilson will be preaching. So I know you'll be enjoying that next week. Uh, let's see. We have two titles today. Two different titles. If you're not a Christian, the title is, What Have You Got to Lose? And you're just checking out. The title is, What Have You Got to Lose? If you're already a Christian, the title is, We Can't Lose. We Cannot Lose. So two different, two different titles for two different uh, groups here. Hopefully, by the end of this, everybody will be a Christian and we'll all have the same title. <laughs> children of Jesus Christ. Children of God. Uh, believers in Jesus Christ. So, 2 Kings 7, 3 to 8 is what we'll be on. And talking about winning and losing, I'm sure m m all of us are exhausted from the election, right? Election night, we should have all just gone to bed. Here we are. It's still not decided, although it looks like it is decided. But there's still battles going on. We should have all gone to descend, all gone to bed. I knew it wasn't going to be decided for a long time. I knew it before it even happened. Everybody's like, I just hope it's one way or the other. Clearly, I'm like, there's going to be division. It it's going to divide our nation even more because this is God's doing. God has a purpose in this, and we can see it coming. If you read the, the Bible, especially but look at the life of Elisha, and you look at our country, and you know God is doing something. We've been talking about that a lot, right? It was a very stressful election night for both sides. I know I definitely felt it. One minute, oh, it looked like we could win. We are going to lose. And both sides feeling this way. Going to win, going to lose, going to win, going to lose. But it hit me that night, and I just had a real peace because it hit me that no matter what happens with this election, or with this country for that matter, no matter what happens with the election or with the country, and we kind of see where this country is going, we can't lose. We cannot lose. God's purpose, as a Christian, God's purpose for our lives, God's purpose for the USA will still be fulfilled. No matter what happens with an election, no matter what happens in the country all the following days, what's going on already, we cannot lose God's purpose for our lives. God's purpose for the USA will still be fulfilled. And we as Christians have the same job either way. Whether our uh, candidate wins or our candidate loses, we as Christians have the same job either way, and that's to live as salt and light. No matter what happens, if our country is blessed and doing awesome, whether it's crashing and divided and craziness, it doesn't matter. We have the same job. In our life, if we're everything is going perfect in our mind, or, or we're going through massive trials. It doesn't matter. We have the same job either way. That is to live as salt and light. That's our job. And we will see biblical proof of this today. In 2 Kings 7, in the life of Elisha, remember Elisha is a picture of the disciples of Jesus Christ. He's a type of that. And we're going to see the, this all showing here that, that we can't lose, that God's purpose will be fulfilled and we have our job to do. Now, look at what happened with Elisha. The idolatry, the famine, the, they look like they're doomed. They experience a window of grace. Oh, we have a chance, but we know it didn't continue. They were given a reprieve, which is an encouragement to us in the dark times that we're in. We we may be in a, I said we may already be in a reprieve. We might already be given that, although it may be, the window may be closing. We don't know. But but the point is, this is an, this passage today is huge encouragement for us as we go through what we're going through in the USA today. Let's pray. Father, I just pray for your mercy and grace that if anybody here is not a Christian yet, that they would put their faith in you, in Jesus today. And if we are Christians, that we would grasp the truth that we can't lose, that we can't lose as long as we're doing what you want us to do, as long as we're fulfilling your purpose for our lives and for our church and for our country, that we can't lose. I just pray that we would have that perspective, that peace, that power. I pray for your mercy and grace now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's read the passage here. 2 Kings 7. Verses, we're going to go verses 3 to 8. And you remember what happened? The famine, 
Elisha prophesies this window of grace that, that it's all going to be wiped away. Verse 3, for temporarily. Verse 3, Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, Why stay here until we die? If we say we will go into the city, the famine is there, and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spear us, we will live. If they kill us, then we will die. At dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. And when they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. And they left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp and entered one of the tents. They ate and drank and carried away silver, gold, clothes, and went off and, and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. We're going to stop there for today. Don't miss next time. Next week, Josh is preaching, but the next time after that, don't miss. We've got some wild, lots of more of this wild story here. So let's just look at verses 3 and 4 starting off. What the four, four lepers... Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go to, into the city, the famine is there and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spear us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. Four lepers. And what are they really saying? What have we got to lose? Let's go surrender to the enemy. What do we, what do we have to lose? Right? What do we have to lose? Now remember, leprosy... Was, was a terrible disease. These four lepers had a terrible disease. Remember Naaman? We just spent all that time with Naaman not too long ago. Go back and listen to that, what leprosy was. It was horrible. They were shunned. They were feared by all. Uh, think of coronavirus on steroids. If you get coronavirus and, and, what you, and it would kill you, but if, that, how would be, what if it was completely deadly, 100%? Everybody would avoid anybody with coronavirus, right? And that's exactly... What the, was with leprosy, they were doomed. If you caught leprosy, you were done. You were, but it wasn't just like dying, you know, with coronavirus rather quickly. You died over years and years. Your flesh literally rotted off your body. Horrible, horrible disease. And they were, they were the four lepers here are a picture of the walking dead. We've talked about that. People with leprosy were the walking dead. They were going to die. They were rotting. It was a visible picture of each one of us spiritually. It's a spiritual picture. It's a physical picture of a spiritual reality. It's the effects of sin that we all have, that we're all born with disease, and that we all embrace. We, we have the sin nature when we embrace it. In fact, in Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 gives us a, a, a picture of this in Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, where it says this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Now, this is a picture of, this is a spiritual leprosy. As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. We were the walking dead. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. We were the walking dead. We were following the world. We were following Satan. We were the walking dead, every one of us. And the worst part of the leprosy and of sin, that we of sin, sin is a picture of leprosy, uh, every one of us, the worst part is we were, the, the leper was cut off from fellowship with God and man. They could not go into the temple. They could not worship. They were completely shut out because of their leprosy. Why? Doesn't that sound so harsh? But our sin nature makes us enemies of God. That's right. Our sin nature makes us enemies of God. In Romans 5.10, it says this. We were God's enemies enemies. We were God's enemies. That's what we were. It's automatic. You, we are born and live as God's enemies. It's automatic. I'm going to give you a picture. I hate, hate to bring up 
politics, but in the USAT, if you are a Democrat, you're a Democrat, you're an enemy of a Republican. If you're a Republican, you're an enemy of a Democrat. Now, I, I know that's not true of, for everybody, but pretty much that's the way it is. There's such a division. It's automatic. You're enemies. We're, we're enemies. <clears throat> but that is a picture, and I hope that doesn't continue that way, but that that is a picture of what happens. We are automatically, when we're born, we're, we are born and live as enemies of God. And these four lepers are a type. They're a picture of each one of us before we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And look what they had to do. Every one of us, before we put our faith in Jesus, we're enemies of God. But look what they had to do because it tells us what we have to do. They surrendered to their enemy, and who wasn't actually there, but it's a picture. They surrendered to the enemy and ended up being saved. <coughs> they experienced grace. They experienced a window of grace. They experienced incredible blessings. They were saved, and that's exactly what has happened to us. If you're a Christian, if you are a Christian, in the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, his death on that cross for us, to pay for our sin, his resurrection from the dead. We put our faith in that to give us a brand new life. The moment you do that, the moment you do that, you have surrendered to our enemy, God. We surrender to the enemy and, and we experience an amazing grace. In fact, back to Romans 5, I'll start with verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still God's enemies, while we were still sinners, while we were in that place, we hated God at that point. God, it says, Christ died for us. Verse 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, dying on the cross for us, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, we were, for if when we were God's enemies... We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We, we, when we put our faith in Jesus, we were reconciled to God. We were no longer his enemies because Jesus sacrificed himself. He paid for our sin. He made a way for us to, to, come, to, come, to come back to God. But there are some differences. There are some differences between our situation and the four lepers. The four lepers, we have it much easier than the four lepers had it. They had no invitation. No invitation, but we are in but we do have an invitation from Jesus Christ. John 3:16 For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We are invited to put our faith in Jesus. They had no promise of safekeeping. They thought they were going to probably die. They, they just had a desperate hope. But we do have, we do have the promise of safe passage. We do have that. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. They also knew they would probably be killed. They were expecting to be killed. They're expecting to die. What have we got to lose, right? But we have the promise of life. We have the promise of life if we surrender to Jesus Christ. We already know we're going to be given life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We ha that's the difference. The, but these four lepers, even though they didn't have these promises and assurance like we do, they were desperate. They had nothing to live for. They were already going to die. They were the walking dead. They were, rot they were rotting to death, right? They were living death. But probably, in, in addition to that, they knew they were going to starve to death. Even before they rotted to death, they're going to starve to death. So they said, we're, we're desperate. So they said in verse, back to the, the passage here, 2 Kings 7, 3 to 4, it says, now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance to the city gate. They said to each other, why stay on here until we die? If we say we'll go to the city, go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we will die. They were desperate. What were they really saying? What have we got to lose? What have we got to lose? And what's the answer to that? Nothing. 
they're facing death every direction. The only possible hope is by surrendering to the enemy. And this is a picture of every one of us, our spiritual lives. We are desperate. Before you find Jesus Christ, before you put your faith in him, we are desperate. We're desperate. We have no hope. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, you have no hope. This country has turned away from Jesus Christ. We have no hope apart from Jesus Christ. This is a, a picture if, if the, 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 that we're desperate. And that's important to come to because we, until we get to that point of desperation and realize we've got nothing to lose, we won't surrender to Jesus Christ. The coronavirus has one positive. There's one positive that I see from the coronavirus. It has forced everyone to face this fact that we are desperate. It's fo forced everyone to face the fact that we could die at any time. Now, it's always true. We could have a heart attack. We could get have a car accident. We could anything could happen to us. We could die any time. We're one heartbeat. We're one breath away from death. But everybody just kind of ignored that fact. But now we can't ignore it because of the coronavirus. We could die any time, and people have been freaked out. They are living in fear. They're desperate. They're desperate. Just like these lepers, these physical lepers, we are spiritual lepers. We are desperate. And I want to say to you, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, do you realize how desperate your situation is? Do you realize that you're the walking dead? Do you realize that you're one breath, one heartbeat away from hell? Do you realize that? Do you realize that? And I want to say to you, surrender to Jesus Christ. What have you got to lose? Nothing. You have nothing to lose, but everything to gain. You have, you have, you have, what to gain is real life. Real life. Not this empty, desperate life that everybody's living apart from Jesus Christ. You can have real life for, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you you, we have, if you are not a Christian yet, I want to encourage you to take that step today. I'm going to pray in just a little bit about and putting our faith in Jesus. If you've never done that, you have, you have got nothing to lose. What have you got to lose? Nothing. But you have everything to gain. You won't be losing anything, but you will gain a lot, including the promise that if you become a Christian, you can't lose. If you are a Christian, or if you become a Christian, you can't lose. If you're already a Christian, we can't lose. We can't lose. Do you need proof of that? Let's go right to 2 Kings 3 verse uh, 7 verse 5. At dusk they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there for the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. So they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. <coughs> Excuse me. So they got up and fled in, in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. Lots of donkey heads are going to be available. <laughs> Remember? Uh, they left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp and entered one of the tents. They ate and drank and carried away silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some of it took some things from it and hid them also. It, it, it's crazy. They, we can't, this is a proof re, that we can't lose. Remember the horses and chariots of fire? How did this happen? These men had surrendered to the enemy and now they found life. Picture of us surrendering to God and now we have life through Jesus Christ. But th this, but if once we do that, we can't lose. And this is proof of that, that, the, that there was horses and chariots that, that scared off the, the enemy army. That's a picture. Remember the horses and chariots of fire we saw back in 2 Kings 6, 16 and 17? I'm going to refresh your memory here. Verse 16, Elisha, they were surrounded by the, another enemy. Remember that? And Elisha told them, uh, oh, I'm sorry, verse 16. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes. And he looked and saw the hills, uh, um, he looked and saw the, Hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Remember that story? We back if you didn't hear that one, go back and listen to that one. It's powerful too. But but there was horses and chariots of fire surrounding Elisha and his servant that were protecting them back when they were surrounded by the first army. Okay? And here we are. 
another chapter for it, a whole other thing for it. The country is an even deeper problem. The whole, you know, uh, Samaria is getting ready to fall. The nation of Israel, not Judah, Israel is getting ready to be wiped out. And, and it's, it's desperate. And yet, the horses and chariots of fire are still there. In fact, they were always there. They are always there now. Look up. Can you see them? Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but can you hear them? Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but we can see what God is doing. We can see how he's using them. They're always there, even when things look desperate, just like with Elisha. Even when things are desperate, the horses and chariots are still there. First time they're surrounded, this time a terrible famine, the king's going to cut off his head. The chariots, horses and chariots of fire were still there, just the same, no matter what. So many, I see so many in our country freaking out over the election. Oh, it's cheating, it's this, it's that. Let, listen, it's been crazy for how many years here? Freaking out. But listen, God is in total control. Yeah, there's a lot of things that we don't like happening. There's a lot of things morally we don't like happening. There's a lot of spiritual things we don't like happening. It, it looks desperate, but God is still in control. Well, this, we got to do something. God could snap his fingers, horses and chariots of fire. They could handle it any time. Nothing can thwart God's purpose. You might be really upset about the election. You might be upset about the last election. I don't know where you're coming from. But I'm going to say this. As upsetting it is, is to us personally... Keep the perspective that we're surrounded by horses and chariots of fire and nothing can thwart God's purpose. Nothing. He could snap his fingers anytime, horses and chariots. He could, he, nothing can thwart his purpose with an election. Nothing can thwart his purpose in the USA today. Nothing can thwart his purpose in our lives. What's going on in our lives, with our job, with our school, with, any, with sports, with an injury, whatever it is. We may not humanly like what we're going through, but we know that God is in control. You get that? We might not like it humanly because we would like a different outcome, whatever it is in our life. But we do know that God is in control. And that got, there's horses and chariots of fire. He's in control. And God opened, back with Elisha and the servant, God opened the servant's eyes and he could see what Elisha could already see. He could see horses and chariots of fire. But now he opens the Syrians, the Aramean Syrians, same, same thing, the, their army's ears. He opened the servant's eyes, but he opens their ears and he can hear them. He can hear the horses and chariots of fire. And they freak out and they run for, run for their life. Now, Elisha could always see and hear them. I don't know how he gets any sleep. <laughs> you know, he probably has to put a spiritual, supernatural earplugs in so he doesn't hear the horses and chariots of fire running around up there. But, but he, he could always see and hear them. That's why he had peace. He had peace when they were surrounded by this, this army. He had peace during the famine, the terrible famine that everybody else was freaking out and dying from. He had peace. Why? Because he could or always see the horses and chariots of fire. He knew God was in control. And he it, it, that it's also why he could make this stunning prophetic promise that the floodgates of heaven are going to open. He could make that in spite of this famine and, and the terrible war and it looked like everything was lost. He could still make this amazing promise that, that there's going to be a window of grace. Why? Because he saw the angels getting ready. He saw them getting their horses ready and the chariots ready and their armor on. He saw them stirring. He knew what was going to happen. And, and we need to have the same spiritual eyesight. We, we have the same protection and promises that Elisha had. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have the same exact protection, said Elisha. Elisha is a type of the disciples. He's a type of us today. We have the same protection. We know from Job 1, 9 and 10, when, when, uh, when Satan's talking to God, he says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge of protection around him and his household and everything he has? So we know we have this hedge of protection. We know we have it. Uh, but even now, as Christians, it's, it's even more intense. We are now under the blood of Jesus Christ. And we know from Hebrews 1.14 that it says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Angels are there to serve us, to protect us, to encourage us. There are spiritual allies. That God uses. God uses them to, to, to help us. 
And and if we have that perspective, we see it, if we keep that perspective that, that we have a hedge of protection, that there's angels all around us, and we have angels helping us, if we have that perspective, it's really not hard to see what God is doing. If we look with the eyes of faith, we can see what he, we can see what he's doing. Whether the, the election goes the way we want it, the election goes the way we don't want it, we can still see what God is doing. I can see it. We can see it if we look with the eyes of faith. We can see that we are in a spiritual war. We're in a spiritual war, and somehow we and angels are are fighting against demons, the fallen angels. We're fighting against them. Ephesians six twelve. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of darkness uh, in the in the heavenly realms. Oh, I'm gonna read it. Uh, for for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of darkness. I'm gonna read it. Galatians, Ephesians. I haven't memorized, but you get to be my age and you start to forget some things. But anyway, Ephesians 6, 12. But I want to quote it exactly because it's such a powerful truth about us. It says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of, of, against the powers of this dark world, and against the sport, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers against the powers of this dark world, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. God must have wanted me to read that three times because he made me forget it. He wanted you to really get this one. That's our struggle. That's our battle. It's like, reminds me of the book, This Present Darkness. I don't know if you've ever read that. It was years ago, probably 30 years ago now it came out. But it's, it's being fulfilled in the USA today. It's crazy. Read it again, This Present Darkness. It's a picture. And also, The Ishbane Conspiracy by uh, Randy Elkhorn is also really good. Shows a spiritual battle. And the best part, the best part about this spiritual battle, although it's hard and it's difficult, the best part is we can't lose. We can't lose. I've been doing the Re Revelation series online. If you haven't been listening to that, start listening. Uh, it's crazy. But, but the great part about doing this series is I'm seeing we can't lose. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be a terrible battle. We're in a terrible battle. But we can't lose. We win. I read the end of the book. I re read the end of Revelation. We win. We can't lose. And God, as you read Revelation, you see that God could wipe out the enemy at any time. In his time. Anytime. In his time. He could do it anytime. We always think, well, Jesus is fighting Satan and it's a really hard battle for him. Listen, it's not Jesus versus Satan. It's the angels versus the demons. And hopefully we are on the side of the angels. All right, hopefully, if you put your faith in Jesus, you are. Otherwise, you're a POW or you're even working for the enemy. You're working for Satan. But I hope you're on the angel side, Jesus side. But, but it, it's that for some reason, God in his purpose has put us in this spiritual war. Angels and, 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 and humans together against demons. He's put us in this spiritual war to refine us, to test us, to grow us, to prepare us for eternity for some reason. But Jesus is not fighting. Fighting Satan. Jesus could win anytime. Anytime. Just move his little finger. You know, little finger. He could anytime. And he will when God's purpose is complete. Jesus will come riding down out of heaven on his white horse and put an end to all this madness. Here and in and in, 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 in the spiritual warfare in the heavens. He's gonna put an end to it. The only question is for us as Christians, what is God's purpose? What is his purpose? What is his, what is his purpose for our lives? The election. Our prayer should not be, God, please help my guy win, whoever that is. Help my guy win. That's not what our prayer should be. And I've tried to say so, tried hard not to pray that prayer. Although I've slept a few times, I got to admit. All right, but, but, God, please accomplish your purpose for your glory. That's our prayer. Not our guy win, not me win here, there. God, please accomplish your purpose for your glory. Thy will be done. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. 
on earth as it is in heaven. That's our prayer. And it, and it might not be what we want on a human level, but it might, that prayer makes sure we're praying God's way. And it should be for all of life, not just an election. Every day, all of our lives, for our kids, for our job, for our spiritual battles, for the refining, for a, a trial we're going through. God, it's not saying get rid of it. Accomplish your purpose for your glory. God, in my life, I want your will to be done. I want your kingdom to become, your kingdom to come. What is best for the U.S. as far as a country goes? What is best? Storing stock market, the economy, the military, low taxes, having our guns. Yeah. What is best? What we think is best for the U.S. may not be what is best for us spiritually. If you didn't hear my sermon last week on prepare for uh, persecution, I'm two weeks ago, prepare for persecution, you know what I'm talking about. It may not be what is best for us spiritually, but our prayer has to stick with God. Your purpose, your glory, your will, your will. That's got to be our constant prayer. Not telling God what we want and claiming it, name it, claiming it. No, no, no. It's God. What is your will? What is your purpose? That's what I want. And remember two things as we're praying this prayer. Number one, there's two vital things to remember. I'm going to repeat them from the title. We can't lose. We can't lose. Even if it looks like we're losing, we can't lose. If, if we see with the eyes of faith and focus on God's purpose, it's impossible to lose. To lose. And I'm talking about eternally. I'm talking about spiritually. It's going to get a lot harder in the USA today for us. It's going to get hard in the US. You read the book of Revelation, it's going to get hard for Christians. Really hard for Christians all over the world. Even harder. Not easier. It's going to get harder. Not easier. We need to keep this perspective that we can't lose. We need to hang on to the promises of God. Very important to, to grasp these promises, to, to meditate on them. There's many promises in God's Word to, to focus on them. And, and even when, it, and, and to, to believe in them, even when it looks like nothing's happening. Even when it looks like nothing's happening, something is happening. It's all around us spiritually. It's happening. Hebrews 11.13 says this, because this is a very important perspective for Christians to have. But in Hebrews 11.13, it says, this is the hall of faith. Talking about the people who are in the hall of faith, and this is what God is talking about here. And in the Hall of Faith, it's talking about all the great things that were happening for the, for the Christians. But verse 13, and also the persecutions that were happening to Christians, verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on the earth. Now, Hebrews 11 has two in the Hall of Faith has two groups. One group shut the mouths of lions and killed giants and, well, you know, de defeated their foes. Uh, David's in there, but not the killing the giant part. But, uh, but Daniel, being saved from the lions and, and being saved from the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, they're all there. They're all there. But there's another side that others were persecuted and killed for the faith and they died and, and the, the sad part. But he says here, they also received their promise. Verse 13 again, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on the earth. They, they, they didn't receive the promises here. They saw it and believed it and, and, and claimed them, really but they didn't receive them on earth. Why? Because they got them in heaven. They got them in heaven. They still got them. God's promises are never defeated. Even if it looks like we didn't get it here, we're going to get it there. They're never defeated, not even by death. Many of God's promises are fulfilled in eternity. Some, some are fulfilled here. Some are fulfilled in eternity, but we hold on to those promises just 
the same. Death, death does not delete God's promise. I see here people, Christians all the time, ah, I guess this old God thing didn't work, faith thing didn't work, you know, I, I, I was living for God and my wife died, or I was living for God and my parents died, or, or, you know, something bad happened, and something bad happened, and this whole God thing didn't work, my, you know, God, listen, God's purposes are not deleted by death. We will still see them fulfilled. We may see them fulfilled here. Many, many are fulfilled here. But we, if we don't see them fulfilled, you still hold on to them and believe in them and, and, and don't give up on them because we're going to see them fulfilled. If we don't see them fulfilled here on earth, we're going to see them fulfilled in heaven. Right after Hebrews 11 is Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, after talking about all this, all that happened and all, the hall of faith and all the people that died before us, Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. What is he talking about? Who's he talking about? The, people, the saints who died before us, the Hall of Faith, they're still watching. And he uses a picture of an Olympic stadium event and all the witnesses are watching and cheering us on. We will either see our promises here Oh, we're going to get front row in heaven and we're going to be seeing them fulfilled in heaven. We're going to see it. We're going to still be cheering on our loved ones. We're going to still be cheering on the, the Christians. We're going to see them fulfilled. Nothing can block God's purpose and God's promises from being fulfilled. Nothing, not coronavirus, not an election result, not uh, the USA crashing as a country, which you know where I'm coming from. If it crashes, it doesn't, it doesn't stop God's promises and purpose. In fact, it's probably fulfilling them. Are we standing on the promises of God? Is there a promise in scripture that you need to hold on tightly to, that you need to live by? It will be fulfilled, either here, there, or in the air. <laughs> Remember that saying? Here on earth, in heaven, or during the rapture, whenever that is. Listen to my Revelation sermon. I solve it all. Okay, so either here, there, or in the air, we're going to receive those promises. We, we as, as Christians, we can't lose. We can't lose. Do you have that power? Do you have that peace? Do you have that promise? As a Christian, I have it. We can't. I can't lose. Can't lose. Could look like I'm losing, but I cannot lose because I can see the horses and chariots of fire. I see what God is doing. We look with eyes of faith and we can see it with the eyes of faith. And through God's word, we can see what God is doing. Can't lose. Do you have that assurance? Do you have that peace, power, and, and promise? Have you surrendered to your enemy, God? That's right. If you're not a Christian, you're enemies with God. You're following the world. You're following Satan. You're a prisoner of war, actively helping him. You know, but, have, but you don't have to stay a prisoner of war, a POW. You can be set free. You can be like the four lepers who go to the enemy, to God, and you find incredible blessing. Have you surrendered your life to God? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you done that? And if not, why not? What have you got to lose? What? Have you got to lose? Emptiness? I remember. We all remember before we put our faith in Christ. Complete emptiness, hopelessness, loneliness, the fear of death, living from pill to pill and puff to puff, just trying to get through the day and, and find some kind of jolt. Living from that pill to pill. What have you got to lose? That's all you got to lose. It's a lie. That, that life is a lie. Life without Jesus Christ is a lie. I, somebody, when we're younger, we think, oh, if I put my faith in Jesus, I'm going to miss out on the fun. We don't miss out on any fun. We miss out on a lot of garbage. Garbage. And the fun we call that crap. We miss out on a lot of crap, a lot of damage, a lot of scars. We're not missing anything. It, it, it might seem like thrilling at first, but sin promises thrills, but ultimately it kills and never fulfills. It promises a thrill, never fulfills, and ultimately kills. Listen, shortcut. You've got nothing to lose by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. John 10.10 10 says this. He says, Do you, John 10.10, 10, when Jesus says, the thief, talking about Satan, he says, the thief comes only to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. 
steal, kill, and destroy. If you're living uh, without Jesus Christ, that's all that's happening to your life. It, it, it's being stolen, it's being killed, it's being destroyed. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. To the full, fulfilling, fulfill. You, the, the, the real life. Do you want real life? Fulfilling life. Purpose, peace, power, now and forever. You get it the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ and it goes on forever throughout all of eternity. Do you want that life? You can have it right now. Back to Ephesians 2. In Ephesians 2, where it says, <clears throat> if I can find it, uh, Ephesians 2, verse 1. Remember I read it? As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. We were going to hell. We were living out hell and we were going to hell. But, verse 4, but because of his great love for us, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Grace. That window of grace. What does that mean? We're saved by grace. A couple verses down. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. Not by works so that no one can save. So that no one can boast. Not by works so that no one can boast. We are saved by putting our faith in God's grace. His grace is his son Jesus took our leprosy. On the cross, took our sin, took our judgment, and died on the cross in our place. Took it on himself. It is finished. And if we will put our faith in what Jesus did for us, his, that grace, if we put our faith in that, we can have life now and forever. Real life, fulfilling life now and forever. Do you have that? Let's pray. Have you ever put your faith in God's grace? Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you ever given your life, surrendered your life to Him? If you haven't, why? What have you got to lose? Just fear? Hell? Living hell here, emptiness, complete emptiness here. No hope, no peace, no power. Why? Because you're following Satan and the world who want to destroy you. He's a thief who only wants to kill and destroy your life. But you can be set free right now. Now, you can no longer live as a POW right now by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you are saved through faith. By putting your faith, nothing you can do. It's only by surrendering to God. Say, God, I repent of my sin. I repent of being your enemy. I repent of the garbage. I repent of fouling state in the world. I repent of everything in my life that goes against your word. I repent. I put my faith in Jesus. My trust, my hope in Jesus. What he did on the cross for me, what he did through his resurrection, I put my faith and hope and trust in him. 
I give my life, I surrender my life to you, God. I pray that you will pray that prayer. I pray that you'll pray it from your heart. I pray that you will surrender completely to Jesus Christ. And if you have prayed that prayer, you do pray that prayer, something amazing has happened. You're no longer a leper. You're no longer a walking dead. You're no longer rotting spiritually. You're no longer dying physically and spiritually. You are now a child of God. You are now set free. You are now under God's protection. And you can't lose. You can never lose because he will take you from here to there. Guaranteed. And if you have prayed that prayer, I encourage you to let somebody know. Maybe there's another Christian in your life or your family or a friend. Maybe you know of a good church nearby. But if you don't, email me nhcc at comcast.net and I will help you get connected. If you're local, come to our church. We'll get you. We'll help you. But I want to encourage you to grow Spiritually, find a good Bible study. Find a good Bible preaching church. Gospel preaching church. For those of us who have already put our faith in Jesus, how is God speaking to us? Maybe we've been discouraged. Maybe we've been freaked out. Maybe we've been panicked over the election or panicked over the coronavirus. Fearful. Maybe we've been living in that fear. But God has shown us today through his word. And what happened with Elisha? He has shown us that we can't lose. God could snap his fingers anytime. He, he's, whatever we're going through, there's a purpose. And he's trying to achieve his purpose in our life. And through us, his purpose, we can't lose. Father, I pray that every one of us would have that truth etched in our mind and in our heart that we cannot lose in Jesus. I pray that we would be able to see with the eyes of faith whatever we're going through. We could see with the eyes of faith. And if there's a promise we need to hang on to, we need to stand on a promise of your, one of your promises. We need to stand on those promises. Lord, I pray that you would just help us. Even if it looks like we die with losing, but we keep holding on, standing on the promise, believing that you will fulfill it, whether we're here, there, or in the air. We're going to see you fulfill your promises. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to, to take one of these two titles. What have, we, what have I got to lose? Or we can't lose. We can't lose. We can't lose. One of those, and I want you to put it on your phone or tape it over the TV, quit watching TV, put a big sign over your TV. Uh, you know, what have I got to lose? Or I can't lose in Jesus. I can't lose. Claim those promises. Claim those promises. And as you find promises in Scripture, as you're reading your Bible, you see a promise, write it down. I got piles of them. I got, here's a pile I'm working, you know, working through right now, remembering promises, Bible verses, claiming them and believing them and living by them. I want to encourage you, even, I'm going to give you permission, even to get a tattoo. What have I got to lose on one arm and I can't lose on the other arm, all right? If you're, if you're going to get a tattoo, that's the only ones you can put on. Uh, what have I got to lose and I can't lose? Awesome, right? It's true. It's true. I want to encourage you to focus on that and meditate on that. And uh, next time we're going to get into even some more exciting things here in 2 Kings 7, okay? Have a blessed week.